Hey, good evening, everyone. Hope um, everyone's doing OK in the lockdown. Tonight we're going to talk about the um, different um, issues to do with visual observing. So um, there's um, the aspect of us uh, doing photography with telescopes and so on, but I think it's interesting to um, look at the things that affect observing at the telescope by eye. So the first thing we're going to look at is, is the eye. So this diagram is just a schematic. It hasn't got a lot of detail in this one, but it shows the cornea, which is not just a, a protective layer. It is actually a refractive element that's part of the eye's optical system. And immediately behind it is a, a liquid called the aqueous humor. And then you see the, uh, there's the pupil. And the, the pupil of the eye act, acts like a, um, an f-stop on a camera lens. If you can imagine, if you want to cut down the light entering the camera, you, um, you actually go to a higher f-stop. And the lower the f-stop, the more open the diaphragm and the camera lens is allowing more light. And so the pupil works in exactly the same way, but it's under involuntary control. So your eye, um, if it detects bright light, it automatically closes the pupil down. Similarly, if um, its uh, light levels drop, then it starts to open. And then immediately behind the pupil is the eye lens. This is another refractive element, but it, it's also used for focusing. Un unlike a camera or a telescope, you actually have a focuser which moves the lens around, or in the case of a telescope, it moves the, the position of the eyepiece to uh, achieve focus. And the eye, it's done by adjusting the shape of the lens. In the diagram, it doesn't show it, but there are muscles attached to it that can stretch it or um, let it relax, and it, it changes the focal, the focal plane. And then at the back of the eye, we have, oh, there's a, another liquid filled area called the vitreous humor. And then at the back of the eye is the retina, which is the area where we actually have light sensitive cells that allow us to see. The central part of it there is called the macula. And people have probably heard of macular generation. If you have problems with that area, it greatly affects your area ability to see detail, um, especially in the area of the fova where the eye's maximum resolution is. This area is packed with um, um, light sensitive cells, mainly cone cells in this area, which are the color sensitive ones. So Basically, any fine detail work, um, such as reading or sewing, things like that, this is where most of that information is gathered in the eye. And then you have the optic nerve that um, takes the information from the retina through to the brain, the optic centre of the brain. So um, in the area immediately in front of the optic nerve, there's actually a blind spot where there are no... Um, light sensitive cells. So let's go on to oh, what's going on here. Here's the next slide. So um, this is taking a closer view at the retina. And you can see here where the optic nerve leaves. Um, actually, not only the optic nerve, but the blood supply for the retina. And it's sort of unusual compared to what you'd expect because the blood supply is actually delivered along the front of the retina and also the nerve connections are along the front. And in fact, that's similar to the way that normal digital cameras work, but they're now moving away from that where they have a, what they call a back, a back illuminated sensor where the, um, the light would come from this side and directly um, intersect the rod and cone cells, which are the light sensitive cells. In front of these is um, various kinds of nerve cells that gather the information from the rods and cones. And then there's a, a layer that um, basically attaches the retina to the, the structure of the eye. 
So, um, yeah, not all um, animals are like this. Um, squid and octopus, um, they actually have the um, blood supply and nerves on what you'd think would be the correct side. But, um, yeah, all vertebrates, um, humans, dogs, cats, uh, have their uh, retina arranged this way round. So um, I was talking about the pupil before. So for astronomy, we're interested in adapting to the ambient light. So um, generally in astronomy, we're um, in low light conditions, not always if you were viewing something like the moon, then that's going to be really bright. So um, this um, situation where you want to be adapted to low light doesn't apply if you're observing the moon. So in the bright light, the iris constricts the pupil, reduces the amount of light. And a smaller pupil actually also improves visual acuity because the, any um, human or vertebrate eye will have some optical aberrations by effectively re cutting down or increasing the f-stop you actually reduce the aberration so that's why you can read more easily in bright light it's actually because the pupil is closed down and the, that makes the optical surfaces involved more close to perfect um, doesn't always work you can have issues like problems with focusing because the as you get older the lens becomes less flexible and also um, other optical errors can occur, um, such as astigmatism, and a smaller pupil doesn't really help that a lot. Hence, you um, have prescription eye eyeglasses to correct any of those problems. In low light, the iris opens up, and so more um, light can reach the ret retina. But as you get older, the maximum pupil size actually reduces. So young people can generally have a bigger size pupil. Um, so it effectively means they, that you can see better in low light when you're younger. But unfortunate for, for us oldies. So as well as um, the size of the pupil, the retina itself undergoes a physiological change to increase the light sensitivity of the rod cells which are the cells mainly used in low light conditions. And that's why your colour vision gets, first, uh, gets very poor when it gets dark, because you're mainly relying on the sensitivity of the rod cells that don't see colour. So there's a transition from light adapted retina called photopic to dark adapted, which is the scotopic state. So if the, um, also, um, not only the rod cell sensitivity change, but also the um, the neurons that um, are reading out the um, effectively the data from the from the rod cells, they um, also effectively increase the gain. And you can think of this as something like changing the ISO of a digital camera, but the, the rods become more sensitive by the accumulation of a substance called rhodopsin, which is very light sensitive and it actually gets destroyed by bright light. And effectively what that's doing is increasing the quantum efficiency of the rod cells. So they become a lot more sensitive to light. There's no real equivalent to that in a digital camera. The, the, um, the chip, if you like, has a fixed sensitivity. So you can adjust the gain on, um, but you can't change the native sensitivity of the um, the chip in a digital camera. The, uh, the overall effect of this is that the the eye sensitivity can, in sort of extreme case, you can have a hundred fold, a hundred million fold um, increase in sensitivity, but it takes quite a while to. Um, achieve maximum sensitivity up to 30 minutes in darkness before your eyes uh, are at their best um, um, light sensitive condition. And uh, on a practical note, if you're wanting to do that and then you go and look at the moon, 
that will completely spoil your dark adaptation. If you look at the moon for a telescope, you're looking at a large, um, brightly lit area. Um, it'll basically undo the uh, adaption to dark conditions. So another point is um, vitamin A. You hear about vitamin A being good for your eyesight. Well, particularly for your eyesight in low light conditions. And this is because the substance rhodopsin, which is also called visual purple, is a protein combined with retinol, and retinol is directly derived from vitamin A. So deficiency of vitamin A can be a problem for being able to see see when it's um, dim light. So, um, but don't go out and ingest large quantities of vitamin A because it can be toxic. So if you're having problems in this area, talk to your optometrist or, or medic. So here um, we have um, a couple of new members that were signed up by Chris Benton. And he um, had them agree to demonstrate the opening of the pupil. So um, we have the uh, member on the left very uh, narrow pupil, so that's not light, ad dark adapted, so bright light. And on the uh, right hand side, we have a fully open pupil. In fact, cats' pupils open much wider than human pupils. They, um, that's one of the reasons they can see better in the dark. They also have a, mu a much higher ratio of cone cells, sorry, rod cells. And the eyes also have a reflective layer behind the retina. So it means if a photon gets through the retina without being detected, there's a chance it'll be reflected and then detected on, on the way back out. So you probably notice this if you see light shining in a cat's eyes at night, they are very shiny. So um, I'm sure those two will um, make very good visual uh, astronomers. Anyway, the, the next thing we have to worry about, apart from the eye, is the observing conditions. So we have the sky background brightness can be caused by the moon, of course. And the other thing is outdoor lighting. If you're in an urban area, you're going to have street lights, house lights, security lights, all that kind of thing. And then there's the ambient lighting. What I mean by that is the lighting just where you are. For example, you might have a reasonably dark sky where you are, but it's going to be a problem if there's a really bright security light shining in your eyes. Um, and the other thing about um, the observing conditions is the seeing and clarity of the sky. So. We'll um, look at those in a bit more detail. So the sky background brightness, you can actually measure this using a, an instrument called a, a sky quality meter. I don't think they're very expensive and the society does own some. And the um, I think um, might be available from Astrons actually if you're interested in buying one. But um, these days th this information can also be obtained from satellite data with cameras looking down at the uh, brightness of the Earth when looking down at night when the sky is clear. So the way this is measured is in magnitudes per square arc second. Arc second. So an arc second is quite a small uh, area of sky, obviously, and a magnitude as a, as a method of measuring the brightness of something. Um, we have talked about that in another talks and um, star brightness is measured in magnitudes. Essentially, um, the brightest stars were originally ranked number one or magnitude one, and then the ones you could just see were ranked magnitude six. That was system was invented by the ancient Greeks, but it's been modernized so that it becomes a continuous scale where the magnitude of the sun is something like minus 26 point something and the faintest stars that the Hubble Space Telescope can see are something like plus 32. So that um, another term for this magnitude per area is sometimes called surface brightness as well. 
and we'll talk a bit more about that towards the end because it's important for observing things like nebula and galaxies. So um, if we want to relate the sky background to visual observing, we can use a, a sort of an empirical scale called the Bortle scale. And we'll flip on to the uh, slide that shows the Bortle scale. So Bortle scale one is the really the darkest places on Earth where maybe the outback in Australia, possibly Great Barrier Island, um, dark sky uh, sites like that. And it shows you the, um, the sky quality measurement. So around 22 magnitudes per square arc seconds for a really dark sky site. And then we go up through um, typical dark sky, Bortle 2, rural sky 3, um, four is sort of rural to suburban transition, and five suburban sky, and then you go all the way to the inner city where basically you can't see much at all other than the moon and, and the brightest um, stars in some planets. So um, what I'd uh, suggest you do is Google um, Bortle scale. You'll find that um, they tell you what you can expect to see um, at each level in terms of nebula and zodiacal light and things like that. So the ambient lighting, so as I said before, this is your local lighting, which could be street lights, security lights. So even if you've got quite good over, overhead sky, the ambient lighting can cause you a problem. Um, red light sources are less problematic, and that's why if you go to a star party, we tell people use red torches or cover your torch with a red cellophane or a red, red filter. You can still see well enough to move around, but um, it doesn't cause problems for ruining people's dark adaption. Now, um, the ambient lighting you can mitigate to some degree, maybe using screens to block off a street light or um, trees, some of, something like that, moving your telescope to a better observing position. There are other methods that I won't mention. I don't condone them, but um, you can imagine. OK, the other thing is, is to do with the sky conditions as well. This isn't simply caused by or isn't caused by artificial lighting or anything like that. It's more to do with turbulence and weather conditions. You'll notice if you see the stars twinkling a lot, this is called scintillation. And if that's really strong, then generally the seeing is going to be bad. And what you'll see when you're looking at stars in a telescope under the sort of conditions, the images of the stars will be dancing around and and it's really um, not so great for, for viewing in those conditions. Caused by turbulence, you can also get thin high cloud smoke even that reduce clarity by scattering light. And um, anyway, we can get a, a measure of this by how much um, detail you can see on the sky. In other words, the resolution measured in arc seconds. So if you can see detail down to one arc second sky, that's actually very good, especially at sea level. If you go up to the um, Atacama Desert in the Andes, um, they get, well, it's, that's bad seeing as would be one arc second. Uh, they get um, much less than an arc second. Um, other places um, around the country. Uh, this might be a little bit controversial to some people in the South Island, but Auckland actually has the best seeing in the country or among the best seeing. And this has been um, seen through imaging um, done at the Stardome Observatory by Dr. Grant Christie. And it's thought the reason for this is that there's no real high mountains around Auckland so often when the weather's settled you don't get a lot of turbulence high up whereas the Mount John Observatory down in the South Island where you think oh they're high it's a dark site that it would be better but in fact they're not really high enough there to get above the turbulence and the actual mountains the higher mountains 
near them actually make the turbulence worse. So we will often get much better seeing here than they do there. We do, of course, suffer light pollution here, which they don't. So um, just um, be aware that seeing shouldn't be confused with your local telescope conditions, such as a, a big temperature gradient between the telescope optics and the air. This will cause local um, tube currents, as they're called, or warm air wafting off the telescope as it cools down, and this will definitely interfere with your view. Um, I've noticed an interesting effect at the Stardome Observatory where even if the telescope is cooled down, somebody opens the door down the stairs, you get warm air wafting up the stairs and suddenly the, the image starts shimmering and, and going to pieces and until the doors close and things settle down again. So the way you deal to this is um, you either just wait till your telescope um, comes down to the ambient air temperature if you've moved it outside. You can force it with um, fans. They blow, um, in the case of a reflecting telescope, you have fans on the back of the mirror that help cool the mirror down into equilibrium with the surrounding air. So um, we'll move on now to um, telescope basics and um, what the effect of this on um, visual observation, but some other more general things as well. So the diagram here shows a simplified diagram of a refracting telescope. Real ones will have a more complex ob objective lens like a doublet or triplet. But the main thing is that the objective lens brings the light to a focus and then you use an eyepiece to magnify the focused image. And you see here we have some things here. That's the focal length of the objective, the distance between the objective and the focus, and the focal length of the eyepiece. And you'll have a focus so where the position of the eyepiece can be adjusted to bring, bring it to focus for to match your eye. So some of the definitions that we use. So the capital D there, that's the aperture size of the primary lens or mirror of the telescope. Um, um, amateur telescopes typically can be quite small. Maybe if you have a pair of binoculars, um, 30 millimetres might be um, a small pair of binoculars, 50 millimetres. Telescopes generally start at about um, 75 millimetres and then basically as, as large a telescope as you want and can afford some homemade ones that have made well over a metre diameter mirror. But um, f is the focal ratio of the telescope and this corresponds to the f-stop of a camera lens. For example, we would say that a telescope is f6 and um, in a camera lens, though, you can, because it has a diaphragm, you can change the f the f ratio. Um, for example, if you're in really bright light, you might wind the f stop um, up to bring it, say, to f8, f16, something like that, to reduce the amount of light. Normally, we don't want to do that in a telescope, so it's just a fixed number, and um, just based on the design of the telescope. So there might be a couple of occasions where you do stop down. For example, if you're viewing the moon or, or the sun with a filter, you might want to stop, stop down. So we've got the focal lengths. The first one, EFT, is the focal length of the telescope. And we have the focal length of the eyepiece. So they have their own focal lengths, and we'll explain that a bit further on. There's uh, the AFOV or the apparent field of view of the eyepiece. And what this is, when you look into the eyepiece, it's how wide the field looks to your eye and it's measured in degrees. So an eyepiece with a narrow um, AFOV, it would be like looking through, imagine looking through a, a drain pipe or something quite narrow. So um, this is um, basically 
the design of the eyepiece that, that gives you this. And then we have the TFOV, which is the true field of view, which is the area of the sky you can actually see. How much of the sky can you see when you're looking through the eyepiece at the telescope? We have another thing called the exit pupil size, and we'll get on to explain what that is. And we also have eye relief. Now, the eye relief is how close does your eye need to be to the eyepiece to see the whole field of view. If you have to stick your eye really, really close, then you'd say that eyepiece has a, sh has a short eye relief. And there may be reasons you may not want that, as I'll explain later. And then finally, we have M, the magnification of the telescope eyepiece combination. So we'll come on to the next slide. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, is D, or the aperture. And it says the aperture is king, and I've got a question mark on that because all else being equal, both the faintness of the objects that you can see and the finest detail you can see is ultimately governed by the telescope aperture. So in other words, a bigger telescope is better. But um, yeah, is everything else equal? There are some reasons, and I'll get onto that a bit further on. But uh, the reason aperture is so important because the amount of light gathered depends on the area of the primary lens or bigger. Simply, the, the bigger it is, the more light um, gets focused. And this is why professional astronomers want to build things like the 30 metre telescope, where the main mirror is 30 metres across, although made in, made in segments. So um, generally, bigger is better. However, there's some obvious issues with this. OK, so from the size of the aperture, we can estimate um, what's known as the limiting magnitude. In other words, the, the, the faintest star that you'll be able to see in your telescope, mainly dependent on, the, the apart from the sky conditions, the aperture of the telescope. But the, the best resolution of your telescope also depends on the aperture. So we have this formula, and it's notice it's an approximation. The sine of this angle is equal to this number times the wavelength of light divided by the aperture. So the bigger the aperture gets, the smaller the angle. The smaller the angle, the finer the detail you can see. Um, the wavelength has an effect as well. If the wavelength is um, smaller, like blue light and blue light, you'll have basically be able to see finer detail than in red light. And um, so, um, yeah, the uh, aperture wins on both how faint you can go and how fine you can go. But as I said, all else is not equal. And the most obvious thing is how big can you afford? I'm sure if we could afford a 30 metre telescope, we'd um, probably invest in one if we were keen. But, um, you need a big observatory to house it. And it's a bit, um, well, you're not getting the best use of it if you house the thing at sea level either. And you, it's also not going to be easily transported around if you want to move it to a dark sky site. So the sky conditions is one reason, the portability. Um, even moving your telescope in and out of storage at home, even if you're not wanting to take somewhere in a vehicle. The other issue you reach is that the aperture of the telescope increases the detail, but you very quickly run into the limitation of the seeing conditions. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, further on. The other thing that can be negative about a large aperture telescope, it can take longer to cool down. There's going to be a lot more glass, a lot more mass in it. Um, so you're probably going to have to use some sort of forced fan to um, achieve equilibrium, that kind of thing. So 
this table gives an estimate of the um, the limiting magnitude that you can see. So in other words, the brightness, the faintest star you can see with a given aperture. And this is pretty optimistic, actually. It assumes probably perfect vision, perfect optics and perfect sky conditions. So the first one aperture of six millimetres, that refers to an average sort of dark adapted pupil of an eye. Somebody young might have an eight millimetre pupil. Um, cat, probably 10 millimetres, as was uh, showing before. 50 millimetres would be binoculars and then a small telescope, 100 millimetre, four inch scope, up to a fairly large telescope with a 20 inch lens or mirror. And you see that visually you can go to fainter and fainter stars. And remember that magnitude is not a linear scale. So the difference between um, magnitude 6 and magnitude 12 is actually a hundredfold. So, uh, sorry, five magnitude. Yeah, if there's five magnitudes difference, then it's a hundredfold change in brightness. So if you go from magnitude 6 to magnitude 11, difference is five magnitudes. So that's a hundredfold change in brightness. So um, it's a logarithmic scale, in fact. So... Basically, a large telescope can go much fainter than your eye, um, something of the order of um, maybe 10,000 times um, fainter stars you can see in a 20-inch telescope. So um, this is just a guideline. It'll vary depending on the specific telescope. And generally, it's agreed that a quality refractor like an APO will perform better than a reflector of the same aperture. So a four inch reflector will perform better than a four inch, sorry, four inch refractor will perform better than a four inch reflector. But the problem is that you've got a big difference in price. The four inch ref refractor will cost much more than the equivalent um, reflector. And when you get to um, really large apertures, not only the price, but um, re refractors become really cumbersome when you get to, say, 8, 12 inches and so on. The largest refractor ever built is the Yerkes refractor built by Alvin Clark and Sons, which is something like 39 inches aperture, which is over a metre or something like a metre. Um, but they've never built lenses greater size than that. They're just too cumbersome expensive and and the engineering of a telescope like that is a, a real problem so for example the 40 meter telescope or 30 meter telescope that's being proposed in the andes that's going to be um really a, a large reflector now um if you want more accurate results on this limiting magnitude, I recommend this site here. Look up um, www.crucis.com slash scope slash limiting magnitude. And it comes up with a calculator. You put in all sorts of things like um, the size of your telescope, what sort it is, your um, um, sky conditions, your age, how dirty your optics are even if you've got it even accounts for if you've got a optics that need cleaning and you um, own up to that, it'll basically show you the effect of that on on how faint you can go. So uh, worthwhile having a look at that if you're interested. Um, there's the link there. So um, we're going from how faint uh, uh, things can be with a limiting magnitude to resolution. So fundamentally, um, what happens when a telescope brings a star to focus? It doesn't bring it to a point. It brings it to the um, what's known as the airy disk. And the central part of um, the bright area there is called the airy disk. And the rings around that are diffraction rings. Um, there's no way you can get rid of those. They're, they're actually exaggerated in brightness here. The actual um, first diffraction ring you might just be able to see, but they, they rapidly get a lot fainter. 
and this is basically the wave nature of light. There's nothing you can do to stop this happening. And the airy disk has a has a finite size that isn't a point. So the a diagram here you show two stars close together, and as they merge, you reach a point where you can't distinguish them, and this is the resolution limit. So the airy disk, although it's showing large here, it's actually very small. You have to put a lot of magnification on to be able to see it, and you also need good seeing conditions. And quite often um, to see it, you use a, instead of using a star under the sky, if you're having problems with seeing, you can use an artificial star using a light shining off a Christmas tree ornament at a distance. So that, that will give you an artificial star, but because you're observing it through less air, you'll have less problems with um, atmospheric disturbance. That trick is often used as uh, for collimating the optics of reflecting telescopes. But th this um, example here is showing perfect conditions. So the, the air is perfectly still. So you still get to the point where you can only just distinguish that there's two stars there rather than one. And that's basically the limit to resolution of your telescope. And it does depend on aperture. But in real life, um, you will hit the seeing condition limit before you hit the, the limit of the telescope. And I'll show you why. Uh, basically, once you've hit that limit, it doesn't matter how much extra magnification you stack on. You could stack Barlow's um, endlessly and go to 10,000 times, which would be ridiculous. But you're not actually improving anything. You're just making things bigger and fainter without actually being able to see any more detail. So this is an example here. There's two ways of making this estimate of how closely two stars can be and still resolve them. Um, and they talk about this is for a diffraction limited telescope. So you've got really good optics. And um, one method is called the Rally limit and the other is the Dawes limit. The Dawes limit is a bit um, um, more optimistic as can, than you'd say than the rally limit. But a lot of um, experienced binary star observers say that they can do the Dawes limit or reach the Dawes limit or even better. And you see that a 90 millimetre, quite a small telescope, you can go down to quite a small resolution. And in fact, a six inch scope, you can do better than one arc second. And I remember I said before that seeing of one arc second was considered really good. So, uh, especially at sea level. So, in reality, uh, you can't with a 20 inch scope resolve really any more than you can with a six inch telescope. And it's purely because of this um, limit caused by the, um, the atmosphere. Obviously, the, the doors limit for a 20 inch telescope is much smaller, but you can never really achieve that because the atmosphere messes things up for you. There's still, you can go much fainter with the large aperture telescope. So some formulas. Um, if you don't know the focal length of your telescope, but you know the diameter of the mirror or lens, and the F ratio, for example, a telescope will often be sold as a, an aperture of 200 millimetre F6. So the, uh, the focal length can be immediately calculated. Just multiply the, the focal ratio six times the aperture and your focal length is 1200 millimetres. Uh, magnification. To work that out, it's actually just the focal length of the telescope divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So the shorter the focal length of the eyepiece, the higher the magnification. So um, if you want to observe planets or something, you probably want to have a shorter focal length eyepiece because they're bright, but you want to see more detail. And just an example here, 
an Aspron's 800 millimeter six Dobsonian, which is a fairly common telescope, can with a 28, sorry, 25 millimeter eyepiece, plug in the numbers, and you get that the magnification there is 48 times. If you um, had a 10 mil eyepiece instead, then that would be 120 times magnification. So um, now we come to apparent field of view and true field of view. So what I've done here, I've used a plugin in the Stellarium program, and it's called Ocular. What it does, you tell it what telescope and eyepiece combo you're using, and it will show you um, what you can actually see in the eyepiece, uh, as you see in this circle here. So this is looking at the star cluster Messier 41 and, and the um, Canis Major, the big dog. So it's what it's showing me is for I've got an eight inch F6 Dobsonian telescope and I'm using a 30 millimeter GSO Superview eyepiece. So the the plugin already knows what the apparent field of view of that eyepiece is, so it can calculate what the true field will be. So if you're planning your observing session, you can use this to figure out what may be the best eyepiece combo to um, to um, frame the object you want to look at. So the apparent field of view isn't something you can do about it. It's uh, inherent in the design of the eyepiece, and it's related to the field stop of the eyepiece. So the manufacturer will set the field stop based on giving you a field of view which is corrected to the edge of the field. So to have a, b a bigger apparent field of view, you need a bigger field stop, and it means that it becomes harder to optically correct the whole field of view. So what that means is that eyepieces with a wide apparent field of view are going to cost you more, and the optics of them is a lot more complicated. And here's some examples. I just say you've got a 21 mil plus or eyepiece, which is a fairly low cost, commonly used amateur eyepiece design. Um, gives you an apparent field of view of 50 degrees. Um, an old, typical ultra wide eyepiece, same focal length, so the magnification is the same, but you're getting to see an 82 degree apparent field of view, so that means you can see more of the sky at the same magnification. And then you go to something like a Teleview Ethos um, brand of eyepiece, they're quite expensive. Um, one of those will cost you more than a, than a six inch Dobsonian, sorry, an eight inch Dobsonian telescope. So whether you want to invest in something like that, it's going to be expensive. So all three being the same focal length give you the same magnification. And as I said, the wider angle eyepieces are going to be more expensive because it has to have correction right to the edge of the field, otherwise you're not going to be very happy where you've got a 100 degree field, but the outer parts of the field, the stars are just all smeared out, be a bit of a waste of time. So we can actually calculate the true field from the apparent field. We just divide the apparent field of view by the magnification and it tells us what the true field of the uh, of view is going to be when we um, have calculated the magnif magnification of the eyepiece with that particular eyepiece telescope combination. So just showing an example at the bottom here, we have the true field of view where the apparent field is 50 degrees, so a plus a eyepiece probably, divide by um, 48, which was the magnification we looked at before in the example. And so that will give you approximately a one degree true field of view on the sky. So earlier on, I mentioned eye relief and I didn't really explain it too much, but it's the um, place where you have to put your eye to see the whole field of view. And as you can see here, 
um, the diagram showing the, the real image formed by the telescope is um, number one there, the red arrow, and notice it's upside down there, with, which is what happens with a normal astronomical refractor. Um, the field stop is, is right by the, um, the, the, um, the image, and then you have the eye relief, which is the distance that you place your eye from the um, from the telescope. And you notice number four here, that's the size of the cone of light coming out of the eyepiece at the position of the eye relief. You know, the reason the eye relief is important, if you have astigmatism and you want to use, need to use eyeglasses with a telescope, if the eyepiece has a short eye relief, then you won't be able to use that eyepiece with eyeglasses because you can't physically get close and get your eye eye and with eyeglasses close enough in. So generally, if you want to view, you want to use eyepieces with um, a long eye relief. You can get specialised eye relief, uh, long eye relief eyepieces. Typically, things like plossals, as you go to higher and higher magnification, shorter focal lengths, the eye relief will get less, um, which is a bit of a pain if you have to wear eyeglasses. But if you're just near or far sighted, you don't have to worry about that. You can adjust for that, but just by refocusing the telescope. Um, one useful thing about um, um, the Barlow lens, actually, is that when you combine it with an eyepiece, it effectively doubles the focal length. So if it's a, a two times Barlow, um, sorry, halves the focal length. So um, you um, don't change the eye relief, so it means you can get more magnification and still use it with your eyeglasses. You don't have to buy a, a more expensive um, eyepiece. So I've basically already said everything here. Just a um, technical information about what the exit pupil I was talking about. So it's actually the image of the aperture of the telescope as seen from a point on the optic axis in the image plane. And you can actually calculate the size of the exit pupil. It's equal to the aperture of the eyepiece divided by the magnification you're using. So why do we really care about this? Well, this sets a lower limit on magnification because if your magnification becomes really low, the exit pupil becomes big, and eventually it will be greater than the size of the pupil of your eye, which means that a lot of the light is getting blocked by your iris. So the view is going to become dimmer. So um, you might think you want to get a wide field of view with a low magnification, but you reach this problem that once, once the exit pupil becomes greater than the size of your eye pupil, you um, basically start getting a dimmer view. So that's something to be aware of. So final part of the talk, we want to get at um, some specifics of viewing particular objects. So I've got some titles here, viewing the sun, the moon, the planets, stars and clusters, planetary nebula, um, other nebula and galaxies, and you'll see why I've um, uh, listed planetary nebula separately when we get to them. OK, the sun, for viewing the sun, the main consideration is safety. So you really need to worry that the sun is incredibly bright. Viewing it for through a telescope without some kind of protection, you're going to ruin your eyesight, probably cause blindness. Don't do it. What you need to do is a suitable fill, ap full aperture filter, which is um, um, the special solar filter you can get from Beta Planetarium in Germany, which is safe to put over the um, um, the main aperture of your telescope. So you're blocking the light before it even gets into the telescope. Now, with a large aperture, you don't you you don't even want to cover the whole aperture with film, you basically cover it with a complete block block out like a, 
a plastic cover and cut a hole in it of what, whatever you really want. You normally don't need more than two or three inches because you're going to get to um, an image that will be too bright again. Um, whenever you use these, make sure that the film hasn't been damaged if you've stored it away. Inspect it to make sure there's no holes or damage to the film. And um, But it is quite safe to use this film as a full aperture filter to view the sun. And it's great for viewing sunspots and and things like that on the sun. You won't see some of the really amazing detail you can see through what I'm going to talk about next. And these are specialized solar telescopes. Instead of a general blocking filter like the Beta Planetarium film, you um, can get specialized narrow band filters, which um, only let one really, really fine wavelength of light to get through the filter. So um, common ones of these are hydrogen alpha, alpha filters, which is um, one of the lines of hydrogen. And of course, there's a lot of hydrogen in the sun emitting this kind of light and emission lines. And we also have calcium K line, which is quite common for solar telescopes, one of the emission lines of calcium. Even when you use these um, um, narrow band filters, as they called the telescopes, also come with a blocking filter because even the narrow band light is still too bright to view direct, directly. Whenever you're doing this, viewing the sun, I recommend you either remove or securely cap the finder so you don't accidentally look through the finder scope at the sun. Um, trick I use if you want to line the telescope up with the sun, you use the shadow of the optical tube. So when you've got a round, purely round shadow, you know that the telescope is aimed directly at the sun. There are other special um, um, alignment um, schemes that are used with purpose um, solar scopes that you can buy, like the um, Coronado ones from Mead, and there's other brands like Daystar. Um, they're pretty expensive though, so you have to be a reasonably keen solar observer to um, buy one of those, but they do give amazing views of the sun. You can see all of the detail on the sun surface, the um, prominences, faculae, um, spicules and things like that. Another way you can do it with a small telescope is to use eyepiece projection where you don't use a filter but you have a small aperture telescope with an eyepiece that you should consider expendable because it's going to get quite hot probably even though the actual focal point isn't in the eyepiece itself it's still I'm going to get pretty warm and you um, project the image onto a card and then you can safely look at the image of the sun on the card. Um, whatever you do, um, some of the cheap department store scopes might come with a, an eyepiece um, blocking filter. Don't use them, they're really dangerous. That, that's going to get hot and it could easily crack and um, um, yeah. Don't go there. So the moon, as I mentioned towards the beginning of the talk, it's incredibly bright. It's like observing a daylight scene. So dark adaption is not needed at all. In fact, you can use a neutral filter if you want to cut out some of the glare. And for this kind of thing, a, an eyepiece filter is fine because the moonlight isn't going to um, actually damage your eyesight or cause heat, a great deal of heat. But if you're doing the lunar viewing, then either do it after you've done your um, star and nebula viewing or expect to wait some time for your eyes to adjust because yeah, your um, night adaption is going to be ruined by viewing, viewing the moon. So the planets, again, really you don't need to be dark adapted to view the planets either. They can be quite easily viewed from city area. The most important thing is the planets is actually the sky clarity and the seeing. 
rather than light pollution as such. So because this planets are small, so you want to use a lot of magnification. So um, yeah, that's the main thing. You um, want to see detail, crank up the magnification and don't really care too much about being dark adapted. Now, when you are needing to be dark adapted, um, there's a, a little technique before we get into the remaining objects. It's called averted vision. And it comes back to the, um, the physiology of the eye. Remember I talked about the area in the central part of your view called the macula and the fovea. They're rich in cone cells. And the cone cells see colour and they've got that fine detail but they don't work very well in dim light. So the outer part of the retina away from the macula, um, that part of the retina is richer in the rod cells and they are more light sensitive. So you'll find the trick if you wanting to see something faint in the field of view, don't look directly at where you think it is, focus a point away from it and you'll find that things actually pop into view. And this is because of the greater density of the rod cells in the outer part of, of the uh, retina. So it's a technique that's worth learning for visual observing, especially with faint objects. So um, stars and clusters, some of the brighter ones you can view from urban skies quite easily. It's always better if it's darker because then the faintest stars are easier to see, but there's quite a lot of bright star clusters that you can see under fairly bad um, light pollution conditions, such as uh, things like um, um, NGC 6231 and Scorpius. Um, yeah, star, where the, the actual bra stars in the cluster are quite bright. Even uh, M41 I was talking about before, and that field of view um, slide. So for viewing clusters, you might want to choose the best um, um, field of view for the clusters you're viewing to, to frame them. If you're using too high magnification, you might only be able to center, see the center of the cluster. So it might actually um, be not, not what you want. This is actually a problem at the observatory with the Zeiss telescope which has a really long focal length, 6.6 .6 metres. And um, even if you use a wide, what's considered a wide angle eyepiece on that telescope, you still get quite a narrow field of view. And some of the clusters, because of that, you can't actually see the entire cluster. So you might be better viewing those with a, a smaller aperture telescope. With stars, you can actually see the colour of the stars. And to my eyes, they range from white, but we refer to those in astronomy as, as stars towards the blue end of the spectrum. But we usually, most people can't actually see them as being blue because they're still putting out a lot of light in green and red. So it still tends to point, appear as white to our um, eyes. But if they're really, a really harsh looking white, Generally, they'll be the hotter, bluer stars. You go down to red to coppery red to the reddish stars, are the stars that are the um, really the coolest stars, and particularly carbon stars they have this coppery red look. And if you want to see the contrast, have a look at the really bright star Beta Crucis or Mimosa, fairly high magnification. You'll see in the same field. There's a really deep red, coppery red star called DY Crucis. It is a variable, um, so it does change a bit over time. But it's quite interesting to see the incredible difference between Mimosa, which is um, Beta Crucis, one of the bluest stars in the sky, to um, DY Crucis, which is one of the reddest, or at times the reddest star you can visually see. So um, the other thing about stars is quite a lot of people are interested in viewing binaries. 
separating them. Some binaries are quite interesting to view because they'll be different. Um, um, the way Crucis and Mosa are not a binary pair. They're not actually they're related to each other. They're just in the same line of sight, but some stars can be orbiting each other, so they are physically close. And um, to separate them, you might need to use high magnification, go as high as the seeing will permit. Yeah, we'll come to the planetary nebula. And um, I talked about um, sky quality where you had magnitudes per square arc seconds. And any of these extended objects like nebula, galaxies, or in fact planets and the moon are extended objects as well. Um, but the brightness of those is so bright we don't really worry too much about the surface brightness. But for planetary nebula, it really does matter because if they have a low surface brightness, the surface brightness is um, dimmer than the background sky glow, then basically you're going to be out of luck. You can't see them. And um, but some of them luckily have quite a high sur surface brightness, given a couple of advantages. The uh, examples like the blue planetary nebula and the ghost of Jupiter, their surface brightness is high enough um, even that you can actually see colour in them. They have a um, generally a blue, bluey green sort of colour um, due to emission lines of um, um, doubly ionised oxygen, a bit of H beta mixed in. Um, some of them though are quite large. They might have a what's quoted as a high magnitude but if they have a large physical size on the sky, that magnitude is spread out over a large area. So the surface brightness is low, so they can be hard to see. And an example is the Helix Nebula, which is nearly as big on the sky as the full moon. But the surface brightness is quite low. I can't see it at all from where I live at home on the North Shore, but if you go out to a dark sky site and it's easy to see it in a pair of binoculars. So um, that's um, the effect of surface brightness. And why planetary nebula I list separately because they are one of the few um, things apart from stars that you can actually see colour in some of them. So we come to nebula and galaxies, they tend to have lower surface brightnesses. There are some brighter ones like the um, Messier 42, the Great Nebula and Orion. You can see from urban skies, not too bad. Central City, you might have a problem. Um, and the Eta Carina Nebula is also very, um, has a high surface brightness. And the Sombrero Galaxy is um, quite good. You can actually see it from the Stardome or urban areas quite easily because um, it's one of those galaxies that has a fairly high surface brightness. But generally these objects, dark skies is the way to go. Um, get out to a rural or dark, or dark sky for best results. So um, that's the end of the talk. Thanks for tuning in and if there is um, any questions, over to Steve. Hey Bill, thanks for that talk. Yeah, we've got a few questions. Um, the first one is from SpiceX4K and they want to know, do you think it's worth to give up the other features just to get a big Dobsonian? Well, it, de it depends on your situation. Um, if you've got an easy way of a good, I, I would say that using one in the city might be a little bit wasted. Um, really, you get a big dob to observe the faint objects, I guess. So if you've got access to a dark site or you're in a dark site and, and you can afford it, then yeah, go for it. So it really depends on what you want to view and your your situation. Other, I can't really uh, say much more than that. OK, next question um, is from Dave, who wants to know, how long after entering darkness does one need to wait before the eyes are about as dark adapted as they will get? Well, um, from what I'm, I've read, it's about half an hour. But even after 10, 15 minutes, they'll be most of the way there. 
it's not a linear curve. Most of the adaption occurs quite quickly, like particularly your pupils opening happens quickly, um, but the physiological change to the retina takes longer. You have to build up the rhodopsin, um, the ganglion cells adjust, effectively ramping up the gain, that kind of thing, that takes longer to happen because there's physical change that's happening in the synapses of the nerve cells of the eye. Um, the rhodopsin has to be built up and so yeah, um, it reaches a certain point and then the improvement is only slow. But from what I've read, it's about half an hour to become fully dark adapted. And, and I think that probably is fair from my own experience as well. But it can be destroyed really quickly. So that, that's why we don't uh, like people shining bright lights around at star parties. Good advice, Bill. Uh, another question from Hardgrave2009, who wants to know any tips or advice for viewing and or taking photos, DSLR, etc., of the blood moon on Friday? Oh, okay, well, that's not really to do with visual observing. Um, the main trick with photographing eclipses of the moon is that um, you have to keep an eye on things. You see these um, images which show the eclipse in various stages, starting from when the um the the basically the umbra first comes onto the moon and from when it's mostly eclipsed there's actually a huge difference in brightness in what you're um photographing there so you will generally have to make big adjustments to the exposure time and or the iso as you're um going through that um, so it is it is quite tricky. You have to you can't just set it up and think you're going to get a nice sequence of images because um, if you started off exposing for the way the moon was full moon at the start, by the time you get to the eclipsed moon, the image is going to be black basically because there's going to be a huge difference in brightness. So you have to keep an eye on it and keep adjusting the brightness. I believe that Astrons are again going to do a live stream. Um, I think um, Steve Dean is going to set up a, a, a telescope with a digital camera and they'll be streaming that onto YouTube. So keep an eye out for that. But while he's doing that, he will be continually adjusting the camera gain and um, exposure length so that um you get a good image so i'm not a, i'm not a great one for imaging but that that would be the advice i would give thanks bill uh robert wants to know um are colored filters good to use and if so what for um there are various kinds of um filters you can use for deep sky observing especially well um, obviously I mentioned the neutral filter for the moon just basically to cut down the brightness um, there are things you can get called light pollution filters which try to block out some of the typical sky background um, in the past a lot of the light pollution was caused by high pressure sodium lights um, street lights and motorway lights, that kind of thing. But a lot of these are being replaced by LEDs. So I suspect that kind of light, which was blocking the sodium lines, um, isn't going to be as effective against LED lighting. So, but there are some other um, filters that um, try to bl block out light except for specific emission lines. And they can help with some nebulas, planetary nebulas, which are really strong emission lines and the sort of blue green area because of the doubly uh, ionized oxygen or the spectral O3 line, as, as it's called in H beta. Um, the yeah, planetary nebula give out really strong emission. So it could be worth it for those and some other nebula. Um, but I guess it's just a case of experiment. Um, it's probably not going to help if you're in the central city where the light pollution is really bad, but it might be worthwhile in the suburbs. And um, sometimes it can actually help improve 
the contrast when you're in a dark sky area where you just want to see the light and those particular wavelengths. But remember, it will dim the overall view. Hopefully that answers the question. Yep, and almost there's quite a lot of questions tonight. Um, James wants to know, what is your opinion on the EV Scope Equinox Digital Telescope? Oh, well, I I've, I've haven't, haven't viewed one of those myself. There's a number of these coming on to the market where people don't know what they are. They're basically a telescope and camera combined, and usually with software that, um, like an app on a smartphone or a computer, that allows you to sit inside and have a look at what the telescope is viewing. So they, they're not sold as a separate mount telescope and camera. They're a combined package, usually a fairly small aperture telescope. Um, and often the the chip they're using is probably a, a smaller resolution, cheaper one, but um, they can be, a, if you're not, haven't got the patience to sit outside and find things, they come with go-to usually. So it could be quite good for beginners if you can afford it. They're, I think they're quite expensive, not because of the optics, but because of the computer control and the fact they come with a digital camera built in. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of opinion about them because I haven't, I've never um, viewed through one myself or looked at one. I know some people are quite keen on them. And Probably then, depends on what you t what you want to do. If you want to s be able to sit inside and view the night sky, maybe it's um, it's for something for you. Thanks, Bill. And the last two questions, um, both from Robert Patterson. Uh, the first one, uh, he wants to know, do you know what the average resolution and image size of the human eye is? Oh, um, the unaided eye. Um, that's a good question. Actually, I'm I'm not quite sure. Um, I guess um, you probably have to Google it. I, I don't actually know off the top of my head what the resolution of the unaided eye is. It's probably not too bad because um, we can see um, fairly, if you've got good eyesight, you can see fairly fine text. Um, yeah, something I'd have to look up. Obviously, if you're using a telescope, the resolution is being enhanced by the uh, telescope optics. And then final if, question. If anybody knows, type it into the chat. Final question, uh, also from Robert, uh, is other than field of view and eye relief, do multi-lens eyepieces, such as those with five or more lenses, have more advantages when compared with to eyepieces with less? And what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, um, obviously extra glass is going to cause more scattering of light. So that's one of the reasons why these multi-lens um, eyepieces like Nagler's and ultra-wides and ethos things, because they have a lot more glass on them, um, you've got internal reflections and scattering, they have to control that so that um, it doesn't spoil the view. And basically, that means they're a lot more costly. They have to put anti-reflective coatings on every optical element, um, or if the elements are in contact, um, they might um, use something like a um, cement or oil. I don't think they use oil these days, but um, yeah, it's just a matter of there, there are issues put, are created by putting all these extra optical elements in, just like with camera lenses. But like if you buy a, a high-end Canon L series lens, there's a heck of a lot of glass in that, but it still delivers a really good image. And there's a reason why those kind of lenses cost so much. It's because they have to yeah, go to all that extra detail to reduce the problems that all that extra glass is going to cause. But I know that there's um, some people, planetary observers, that use specialised planetary observing lenses, which are designed to have absolute minimum scatter so that they get maximised the detail they can see on planets. And some of them are quite simple eyepiece designs like monocentrics. And because you don't care about a wide field because you're observing a planet, you only um, 
really care about the centre part of the field and you don't want a wide field of view, those eyepieces might suit some people. Thanks, Bill. That's things things like, questions. um, yeah, th yep, okay. I, I think they're called things like monocentric and orthoscopic eyepieces, where they don't give you a wide field of view, but they give you a highly corrected, low scatter field of view, but a very narrow one, or relative to the usual sort of eyepieces we're used to. Okay, well, thanks everybody for listening in. And the, oh, just uh, before we go off online, um, there's no talk next week. We're going to use the fifth Monday this time. So the astrophotography talk will be on the fifth Monday of the month. So uh, thanks, everybody.